Hi, this is Jeffrey Tucker, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You might also consider supporting this podcast by sharing it and even donating. LCI needs your help so it can continue creating great content. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the Libertarian Christian Podcast, the project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm Norman Horn, and and with me today is Nick Gausling. And in this episode, we're going to talk about libertarianism versus conservatism. We're going to talk about some of the similarities, some of the differences, and hopefully get to the bottom of, uh, of what we need to do in order to engage with our conservative friends more effectively and, and hopefully come to understand ourselves as libertarians uh, more comprehensively as well. So I think to start off with here, we want to kind of get a definition of what we consider conservatism to be, especially in the context of this episode in particular. So, Nick, why don't we kind of begin with that? What do you think are some of the key characteristics of conservatism? Uh, and then we'll kind of get into how those contrast with libertarianism. Well, I think it it really comes down to a certain way of viewing the world and the things that are uh, most highly prioritized and valued when thinking about political economy. So here's what I mean by that. Yeah, because one thing we should point out here is you said the view of the world, but this isn't, we're not talking about holistic worldviews here. We're talking specifically about political economy, the way that we think about the state and economics in particular. Right. And and we'll, for our listeners, we'll, uh, we'll sort of dive into that a little bit more later in the episode and the different types of conservatism. But yes, in, in this context, we're specifically talking about political conservatism. And so when I say a, a certain way of viewing the world, I mean, as, uh, as far as political economy, a certain way of viewing uh, society and organizations and individuals and how these things all sort of relate. So I, I think the defining characteristic, you'll, you'll find tons of different definitions of what constitutes conservatism, uh, liberalism, even libertarianism. There's there's different sort of schools of thought out here that are pushing in different directions. But I think really the, the hallmark of political conservatism is a it, it has to do with a desire for a certain type of order and preservation of tradition. So and that's I mean really it's in the name conservative. Well, okay, what are you conserving? Uh, you're you're conserving some type of shared tradition, identity, culture, values, uh, and the the idea of conservatism is to sort of be anti-reactionary, uh, whereas progressivism or left progressivism, in contrast, is is sort of the opposite of that. It's it's always trying to change things because it's it's operating under this framework that. Uh, history is always on an upward trend. And so as we go, the things of the past are necessarily uh, inferior to the things of the present. C.S. Lewis called that chronological snobbery. Uh, so it's it, it, progressivism is sort of this idea that everything is always needs to be in flux. It always needs to be changing because uh, essentially what is new is always better than what is old. Whereas conservatism is kind of coming at it from this idea of uh, there's there's great value in the old things and the traditions in, in in these sort of shared cultures and identities, and it's seeking to preserve that. So to sort of sum up what I mean, conservatism the the chief political aim of conservatism is the preservation of tradition and things that are prioritized in the tradition. The chief political aim of progressivism is to change things up and to pursue uh, what they call equality. We obviously dispute that, but through the, through the changing of social institutions. Libertarianism, of course, has a, a different way of looking at what we prioritize in political economy. So, Norman, why don't you discuss a little bit about that. I'm sure most people listening to this show 
already know where we're coming from, but if not, uh, how does how does libertarianism differ? Yeah, I think there's some interesting aspects to what you've described and, and the the temporal nature even of what you've you've just discussed, I think is rather significant. Because on the one hand, the conservative mindset uh, is looking to conserve that which was passed. And and that would include this even the state structures that are there to a, a large extent. I mean, we don't we, we wouldn't necessarily say that they're uh, trying to, you know, conserve every old road or every old library or something like that. That's not really the point, but rather the structures and that and that order that are that are going at, at it. And and likewise, the progressive has a different temporal look at it, which is that they're looking to some type of well, the things that are coming or the things that are new are are inherently better than uh, than that which we've had in the past. And that's not really the position that libertarianism wants to take at all. It doesn't really look at it from some sort of temporal virtuous past or temporally virtuous future that we're gunning to, not in, not in, the, not in that same sense. It's saying that the, what we are absolutely concerned about is something that is more in the present only. And that is what means shall we use to, uh, to accomplish goals in the world. And in particular, it's concerned with how uh, we use force to accomplish those means or to accomplish those ends, it, it, force as a means to those ends. And whereas conservatism and progressivism have no problem fundamentally with the execution of force against individuals in order to either preserve the past or strike out toward a future, libertarianism says to heck with either of those. Uh, we need to be concerned about the morality of our, of our means now. It doesn't actually put, in a sense, an end to what we're gunning for. Uh, from a political point of view and to the order that ought to that ought to exist, it says what what is the order that should exist from a more uh, transcendent perspective and and that it's taking a, a much stronger ethical position uh, than than a than a societal position per se. Libertarianism doesn't need to expound upon uh, every bit of social order in order to make sure that everything is happening in just the right way. Uh, in, in truth, it's letting it's letting society kind of determine that on its own. It doesn't it libertarianism doesn't demand that we give direction in that respect. Um, that, that instead, it's it's concerned with an ethical an ethical value. That is, what is the proper use of force in in the world? Uh, and and that is, you know, if you're for those listening who may be, not be aware uh, of that, we call that the non-aggression principle. And that statement is simply that uh, aggression, the initiation of force or, or fraud against individuals uh, or groups for that matter, is fundamentally unjustifiable. The only way in which that force is uh, permissible is in response to prior initiated force. That would be self-defense. And so that's the way that we that we look at the uh, at the kind of fundamental organization of our interactions together as human beings, because that's the the because we value things like peace and civilization and mutual voluntary interaction and trade and prosperity and all of these things. We know that we're going to get into conflicts, uh, or that there's at least potential for conflicts, and that thus the best way to go about resolving conflicts is by seeing is by essentially looking at it from the perspective of who. Uh, who has a property right in whatever it is that is being disputed, whether that is person, uh, my own body, or whether it is something that we have justfully acquired for ourselves, our, pro our, our physical property may, that is somehow external to our body but is belongs to us. And so these sorts of things are more fundamental than just the question of whether or not something in the past is worth preserving or whether something that could be changed ought to be changed. And, and going to the future in that respect. So whereas, you know, we, we might have a very traditional outlook on life, we as Christians look to our past as in, for inspiration. Obviously, we believe that history, uh, that history has been moving uh, in such a way that, that God is, um, is having, has a plan that is, that is moving forward and we are co-workers in that plan. Uh, that's super important. And we look back 
upon our uh, our church fathers, uh, more both the, the more immediate ones and say our congr- our local congregations, our institutions around us, and going farther back even to the early church fathers and of course to the to the the, the characters of uh, the people that we learn about in the Bible, of course the the risen savior Savior Jesus, and and all of that. That's how we you know per, in that way perhaps we are kind of conservative in a way. Uh, but that's very different from a from a cultural and a theological point of view than from a political point of view, which would seek only primarily to keep in place the orders of of society that are that were present before. The irony of that, of course, is that you know political political conservatism in America is very you know dare I say amerocentric in this regard, in that it would very much it's very interested in per, in preserving sort of the uh, American. Uh, order system, but that certainly wasn't the way that it kind of looked like in the in the revolutionary era, uh, if you will. And so that's, I mean, it's interesting that that's that's kind of relevant here as well. Uh, so you know, th- there's there are some inner contradictions even there is, uh, that we can kind of detect. Whereas really, you know, we're neither to we're neither of the left per se, you know, it is libertarians, and but we are also not of the right. Of We're not liberal, nor are we, well, maybe old-style liberal per se, but not certainly not the neoliberal or the, uh, or, or the progressive liberal type, but we're also not conservatives politically as well, if that, if that makes sense. What do you think about that, Nick? Yeah, I, I think that that pretty much hits it on the head. So, I mean, it, it just boils down to what libertarians prioritize in the in the political order is the preservation of liberty from from aggression, yeah. the, the non-aggression principle. We don't prioritize tradition, although we may side with tradition in certain um, cases, for sure. And we we don't prioritize change, although we may side with change. Uh, we we prioritize liberty. And so it really has to come down to, you know, fundamentally what is being emphasized in your political philosophy. And so that's, that's the distinction between conservatism and, and libertarianism. And it, it leads out into some, some policy overlap where, you know, you, you, you might see uh, conservatives and libertarians agreeing. Uh, it may lead into policy conflict. Uh, as is, is also say. often the case. Policy conflict? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine um, that. So yeah, I, I, as we're approaching this discussion, just just try to think in in those categories for our listeners. Um, it, it fundamentally comes down to what is what is sort of the aim of your political philosophy, and that's really where the difference lies. I think political conservatives love to talk about. Uh, legislating morality, if you will. And that's something that kind of we come into occasional conflict with uh, political conservatives versus libertarians uh, in that, you know, sometimes you'll hear libertarians say things like you can't legislate morality. And you'll sometimes even hear progressives say similar sorts of things. But then, you know, and this even happened, uh, for instance, when when I debated Al Mohler on the radio a couple of years ago, uh, where he, you know, that the the kind of typical response from the political conservative is, well, anything, any type of legislation is that of legislating morality. Uh, and so you're, you're never going to get away from that. But I think there's a, some, a major difference in how we think about that as libertarians versus conservatives is, um, is that morality has different spheres. Uh, what, what sort of spheres would you say are the differences uh, between the, kind of the, just in the way we think, Nick? What do you think about that? So what it really comes down to here is, yes, in, in some sense, the claim that all legislation is, is legislating morality. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in some way that, that, that is correct. But the question is, um, what should or shouldn't we be legislating against? Uh, and so just because something is uh, immoral – doesn't mean that it should be legislated against. And this is not like a novel concept. Uh, even even Augustine, who in, in many cases didn't actually practice this way, but he said uh, that, that not everything which is a, a vice ought to be prohibited by law. So this is even a very ancient concept within 
within Christian theology. Oh, yeah. So there's tons of things that are immoral to do, but that if we considered legislating against it, we would think that's absolutely crazy. You know, you can't legislate against, you know, <laughs> well, you can you can legislate against a line in a court of law or something like that, but you can't just le legislate against all line whatsoever in every you can't enforce that. Right. Right. So the and sphere of how we think about that, it has to be restricted in some way. Absolutely. I mean, and the, the, the statist mindset essentially is that everything can be solved by legislation. Everything can come under the purview of the state. And so, you know, if you have someone who's a, a self-professed conservative and they, they claim to be for small government and yet, I mean, it they go around trying to legislate against all sorts of things that just fit their personal whims. Well, you can't be for small government if you're in favor of legislating on all this stuff, because that necessarily and logically requires a large government. Uh, and, and not only that, in, in many ways, an arbitrary government that doesn't even have any kind of internal consistency or predictability, just sort of whatever you feel large. like at the time. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and again, government based on whimsy. I mean, we, we, we can't imagine like that that would be a good thing, even in the conservatives eyes. But, you know, from what they claim, but yet it's something that they don't really recognize oftentimes is that this is what they're wanting, you know, <laughs> that they that they kind of get to the point where they forget that the government, you know, this is the, the classic Barry Goldwater quote from uh, the, this, I think it's the 60s, you know, the government that can give you everything you want is the same government that can take it all away. So, for example, like this leads into the way that we think about, say, gambling laws, for instance. A lot of us as Christians may have very strong moral, uh, moral ideas about whether or not gambling is a good thing to do. Some people think it's very immoral uh, to do, and some maybe have slightly less uh, stance against it. But either way, you know, it's a we, we as libertarians, whether or not we we think that gambling is a good or a bad idea, uh, we don't believe that you can just per, com, perpetually protect everyone from their bad decisions and make sure that they're just, quote, quote, not sinning in this regard. Likewise, you know, prohibition era uh, laws, whether it's against alcohol prohibition, which most even most Christians now think is, is absolutely an, a terrible thing. Uh, you know, it, it, that's that's clearly something that we, you know, most Christians don't even agree with that anymore. But we as libertarians realize that it's not just prohibition of alcohol that's a problem. It's prohibition of all substances uh, such as that that might be, uh, you know, used or abused like that, whether it's marijuana or crack cocaine or whatever. And it's not because we think that it's moral to to participate in those activities by no means. We're not saying that. It's just that the use of force in order to prevent people from doing that is perhaps a cure that is worse than the, than the disease. And so that's where we draw the line there. Whereas a conservative may be totally fine with maintaining the order that they're looking for uh, by ramping up police activity in order to squelch gambling or squelch alcohol or squelch marijuana or whatever. Uh, we, we don't see that as being, uh, as being a valid response whatsoever. And there's a lot of other ways this can play out. Right. The drug war, I think, is is one of the most imminent examples of this in the last 30 or 40 years or so of uh, political discourse, and particularly since the Reagan administration. But anyone who's in favor of the drug war is is not in favor of small government. And, and I'm willing to make that as a blanket statement. You You cannot – be in favor. You you can't say you're in favor of small government if you are in favor of the drug war, because the logic of the drug war depends upon the idea that the government essentially owns the individual. Right? Government owns your body. Yep. Therefore, government can regulate what you do with your body, and that can and that same philosophy plays out into all kinds of other things, including medical freedom. Oh, yeah. Uh, education, freedom, what you do with your family, uh, all, all sorts of things. So if, if you believe that government owns you, uh, well, and then that also can lead into, I mean, there, there, there's all sorts of outcroppings of this kind of thinking, in, including the worst of which is probably conscription. Uh, right. But if government owns you, it can, it can do what it wants. It. You're its property. 
Uh, but if if you're not government's property, if you're a a sovereign individual under God, created by God with rights, uh, then there, there's the premise of self ownership. Yes, ultimately God owns you, but with through God the stewardship God has delegated, uh, you you have self ownership. Government does not own you, and therefore government cannot control your body. Now you're responsible to God for what you do with it. But government cannot uh, try to usurp the, the, the delegated framework that, that comes down directly from God in creation. Yet that's precisely what it tries to do and what conservatives are defending uh, when, they, when they're in favor of the drug war or any similar policy. I want to reiterate, Nick, what you just said here, too, that you, you made this – kind of rolling statement in a sense, which is, is just wonderful. And that's the idea that something like the drug war is kind of a, is, is really a critical issue to the way that we think about liberty itself. That if, if the government is entitled to regulate the way that you in, ingest substances like that, because on what basis? Because it owns you? I mean, then, then, then that spirals into all sorts of things about the way that we, the, the way that we think about the government being able to do anything at all at that point. And that has to do with the way that we deal with, you know, our medical freedom, our education, conscription, all of these things and more. And this is why this is why we as Christian libertarians and I can't I can't emphasize this enough. Get up to date and learn about the drug war and the arguments against it uh, from our particular Christian point of view, because this is a linchpin issue. And it is not because we think that that as Christian libertarians, we ought to go out and be able to to just just that I just want to go out and smoke a joint every other day or something like that. I've never smoked pot in my life. I don't intend to. It's not an issue to me. But you know what? Like that that this is still a linchpin issue that that spirals into a ton of other stuff. And you should, as a Christian libertarian, never back down on the drug war. You should engage that fully. You should know how to do it, and you need to fight that one. Because that's how, that sort of liberty linchpin issue is absolutely crucial. And if we can't win that, we win nothing. Because if the government owns you there, it owns you everywhere. And so don't forget that. Uh, I think this, this is a really crucial thing um, that, that, we need to, that we need to understand. So you know, to that end, you know, we can give you all sorts of resources on our website, of course. And you know, uh, Lawrence Vance has written a book called The War on Drugs is a War on Freedom, which is a very small book and gives you everything you need to know. It's wonderful. You should take a look at that. We've got talks by Vance on our website and other essays as well. Uh, he's he's a, you know, a giant on this subject. Read up on that. It's super, it's super important because this really comes down to like the, the, a fundamental difference in the way that Christians, uh, that, that libertarians and conservatives value individual liberty differently. And while they may seem kind of similar on the surface, they are just fundamentally juxtaposed. Uh, because again, if you if, if you give government quarter to to own your body in one space, that claim spirals out of control into anything and everything that it wants to touch. So you can't give any quarter on that level than conservatives. Libertarians also view the state fundamentally differently as well. And so, Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I, I mean, it, and it, this comes down to the an internal libertarian debate, also of should there be a state at all? Um, so, I mean, if you're but even barring that, like that's like the way that conservatives think about the state is just different, even than the way that libertarians would view, view either. Well, however we view the state. <laughs> Sure. So for – if you adhere to the definition of conservatism that we've sort of teed up in this episode where you know, you're, you're prioritizing the, the preservation of tradition and culture and what have you, then you're, you're probably going to be inclined to view the state as sort of the, the guardian and the tool to implement that agenda. Uh, precisely because it is a centralized power, and if you're if you're going to sort of forcibly hold on to whatever tra traditions and values that you that you uh, are wanting to preserve, then you're, you're probably going to need some type of centralized uh, place or thing 
from which to wage that battle. And the state, because it is the, the ultimate centralized power, is, is the ideal place to do that if you're a conservative. And so that's why conservatives will gravitate towards, uh, towards the state and the use of the state, as do progressives for, for, for their agenda. I mean, if you're going to initiate large-scale change, whatever that means, uh, if you're going to, to overthrow things and, and have a societal upheaval, which is essentially what the progressive vision is, uh, you, you probably want to do it through the state because that's, that's going to cast your widest net. Uh, and this is why politics a, a, attracts people in – who, who who are power hungry for whatever their agenda happens to be. It's why it is such a vitriolic uh, subject is because you're basically competing over control of this entity, uh, which by virtue of its monopoli monopolization of violence is the most powerful machine available to push your agenda down on everyone else, regardless of whether or not they want it. And that's really at the, at the heart of mainstream politics. That's ultimately what is, what is going on. Whereas for a libertarian, uh, there is an intrinsic, at, at the very least, skepticism of the state, if not an outright uh, identification of the state as an enemy of the people. Uh, so, I mean, if you're a minarchist, meaning you believe in some kind of small government, you believe that some form of the state is necessary, but you Sometimes think it call should be it like a, the night watchman state, you know? Right. The, the idea there being that uh, some kind of government, some kind of state, very small, is necessary for the basic preservation of, uh, uh, of rights and liberties and the defense of the individual and private property in society. Uh, if you're a minarchist, that, that's what you think the state is is there for, uh, and, and 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 again, this is like a whole big argument in in libertarianism that's gone on for really centuries. Uh, but if that's kind of your if if that's your take as as a minarchist libertarian, then your your attitude towards the state is still different from that of the conservative because it's still a skeptical. Your goal is different, your goal is different and, and 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 the approach is different. Yeah. Because you're still looking at the state as something which can very easily get out of control and which needs to be just severely limited. Uh, now, if, if, you're, if you're an anarchist or an anarcho-capitalist, um, and there's different types of, of anarchy, but if you're an anarcho-capitalist, which is, is typically the form of, of anarchism associated with libertarianism, not always, but usually, uh, then you view the state as always and intrinsically bad – uh, for a, a, a whole host of reasons, I mean, the, the, in, including that it it always interferes in the market. So there's always a yeah. violation of property rights going on somehow. With yeah, the state. necessarily initiates force in order to do anything, and it'll probably do a poor job doing it. So, <laughs> right, and that's both an, eth an ethics argument and an economics argument. Right. Uh, so that that that's sort of that sort of breaks down the, the difference in how we, how we look at the state here. But because of that similarity, sometimes, uh, you know, the, le the libertarians are sometimes considered by the left as kind of a right-wing ideology. Uh, and, and heck, even like, you know, some right-wingers will say that, uh, <laughs> will say that libertarians are just a, a more, you know, extreme or, you know, farther along the way in a right wing ideology. In fact, that just, you know, a side story here when I went to, uh, you know, when I went to graduate school in theology for a while, uh, one of my professors who I dearly adore is a wonderful man. And he, 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 uh, he apparently quipped upon the, uh, and I, I heard this secondhand, but apparently he quipped upon the acceptance of my application by the faculty that finally there is someone here more conservative than I. Because uh, because <laughs> he knew that I was a, a hardcore libertarian even then, um, which was just funny because, you know, of, of course, he uh, he, he kind of knew a little better, too, that that it, that I didn't really consider myself a conservative really at all at that point. Um, but it is somewhat of a misconception. And again, this is, you know, when, when the left kind of looks at us as being um, as being right wing, I mean, sometimes well, it also is true, actually, that the right sometimes views uh, libertarians as left. 
<laughs> as somehow that we're that we're of the left in a different way. And, yeah, and, I mean, on the on that point, I mean, you <laughs> you just had your anecdote. I also have an anecdote. <laughs> yeah, nobody knows what this. to do with us, oftentimes. <laughs> yeah, um, because I mean, it, many of us. I, I, I think it's most common for for libertarians to typically come out of conservatism more more than progressivism. Not always. Uh, I, just in my experience, that's generally been the case, and it's certainly the case in 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 my own life. I was a, a neoconservative, so I and I don't even know why I remember this, but <laughs> I, I I remember back in high school when I was a neoconservative, uh, I was I was in marine biology. And I was talking to one of my lab partners. That sounds militaristic. And what do you mean? It's not <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, I, I, I don't even remember how we got onto the topic, but we were talking about politics and he said, I'm a libertarian. And I, I mean, keep in mind, this was a long time ago. I didn't really even know what that meant. And so I said, oh, so you really, you're just like a more extreme form of liberal, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> That's funny because so, I, I once had somebody ask me at church or, or you know, he said, so you're a libertarian. Does that mean you vote green? And <laughs> that was funny. So, so, so let, let, let that be. <laughs> yeah, nobody let story illustrate that there, there, there's hope, OK, because I used to I used to have no idea what I was talking about with this. So, right. <laughs> so there's, there's hope for for even the most hardcore neoconservative. Awesome. <laughs> this is true. And well, and actually that's, you know, that's an interesting you know, sort of side note here. And I think we'll probably talk about that a little bit is that, you know, there, there are, there are many ways in which conservatives can be reached. I mean, we were both you, you, Nick, me, we were both conservatives for the longest time before we kind of figured this out. And, you know, those journeys are unique, but there are similar pathways that, that we can draw upon and, and, you know, to, to help reach other people. But we'll get to that and in, in, in perhaps at the end here and, and with, uh, with a few more little anecdotes or whatnot. Um, but back to kind of the points at hand about, you know, left versus right and, and the way that libertarianism kind of fits in that spectrum, if at all. I mean, to, to a large extent, I think kind of the point here is that libertarianism, I would like, I would say, is that it's orthogonal to these things. We're neither of the left nor of the right. We're not on that spectrum at all. And there's not a, a little line, you know, where you know, on the on the number line where you go, you know, a couple of points to the liberal side or a couple of points to the conservative side. It's a very different way of thinking about this entirely. That 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 spectrum is something that we're kind of inculcated to assume based on, well, frankly, the the society that we live in in America. But that's not reality. The reality is something very different. We take a very different principled stance as to what society should look like and it, with respect to the state and, and the way that we think about force. Uh, and so that goes down to our value system. You know, libertarians don't think about things in the same way uh, as, uh, as conservatives with respect to these sorts of things. Um, but that's not the only like kind of touch point of those value systems. Uh, you know, when it comes down to it, libertarians can have a variety of different values um, without having conservative politics. And this is really important to remember. Uh, because even though like we as Christians may identify very strongly with our theological heritage and that being perhaps a, what might be considered theologically conservative, that doesn't necessarily have to be wrapped up in conservative politics. So th I think that's kind of important to remember here as well is that, you know, there's this pressure that is often around us in theologically conservative circles to identify with the conservative political side as though they are kind of one and the same. I, I mean, they even, why do they call it the GOP? What does the GOP stand for? God's own party, right? So that, that's, uh, well, actually, that's not exactly true. They often call it the grand old party, but then there's the other name too. But that's like, that's sort of the part and parcel to what people think at times. And so I think it's, it's kind of important to, to kind of put out there that it's okay that you, you are, if you're, you should be okay to think about this. Like just because you're a theological conservative out there, ye old listener right now, it is okay to think about libertarianism. You're not abandoning your theologically conservative values. Believe me, all of us here would consider us ourselves very theologically conservative. Maybe we're different in certain ways, 
than other theological conservatives out there. But we we view so many things the same way as you do. Uh, oh, ye theological conservative. That's OK. So I just want to put that out there and make sure that's understood. <laughs> Is that all right, Nick? Hey, folks, Norman Horn here from LCI. Would you do us a quick favor and rank us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe to us? High rankings help us get the word out. And now let's get back to the show. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to qualify it a little bit. Um, this is Go just my it. opinion. Me personally, I, I really don't even like using the terms conservative or liberal when it comes to theology. I, I don't think those are, are helpful. Okay, um, that's fair. <laughs> even... <laughs> Because I mean, like, and, and I would, I would probably, many people would still probably consider me to be mostly a, a, a theologically, theologically conservative. But I, you know, I mean, Christianity, I think, has elements where, and you talked about this a little bit at the beginning, Norman. I mean, in in many ways, you can say it is a conservative religion in that there is a a grounding in history. We're grounded in the history of the world, the history of Israel, the history of the early church. And, and there's value there. That's, that's very important. There's, there's sacredness to that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there's also elements of Christianity that totally just overthrow all preconceived notions that one would get to from the world's ways of thinking. And so in that way, uh, there, there's things about Christianity that are, that are very radical and, and new. Absolutely. So, I think I, I, I think really authentic theology is, is a mix of both of those things. And so I, I personally don't like to use those labels. But for those who do, uh, <laughs> as Maybe. Norm was saying, you know, don't let that be an impediment into into thinking that just because you identify as a theological conservative, you can't be a political libertarian because that's not the case. Yeah, I, I, there's a phrase here that I, I like to. I like to use, I don't talk about it a lot, but I think it's kind of fun. Um, I would like to, I'd like to throw it out there is that really when it comes down to it, we are, we are historically grounded radicals. Is that cool? That, that we have. I like that. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause, because especially as Christians, you know, our attunement to our history, our church history, and, and by that, I mean the history of the universal church is super critical to, to who we are. That is a major part of our, of our identity. And whether you admit it or not, you come to Christianity, uh, you come to Christ as part of the tradition of Christians that come before as well. Uh, that you are not divorced from that. You, you cannot be separated from that where, while it is absolutely true that you have a individual relationship with Christ, uh, you are part of the wonderful and mysterious tradition of the church. And to even fathom uh, getting rid of that is just, it, it's, first of all, it's impossible. But second of all, you wouldn't, why would you ever want to do it? Uh, it's wonderful. But that historical groundedness is what informs how radical that we are and how different that we are from the world and how fundamentally changed that we are in our, in our basest nature and getting back and pressing forward, progressive, if you will, toward the person of Christ with the intervention of the Holy Spirit and the, and the, the sanctification that we're constantly going through, um, through the mediated, uh, you know, the mediation of the Holy Spirit and all of that, you know, we can, we, you know, we can throw out some highfalutin terms and all that, but fundamentally what's going on is that we're, we're conforming closer and closer, uh, as we go to the person of Christ. And, and it's only, and it's only through him that that's happening. Uh, so, that makes us radical. That makes us very different. That makes us changing. So on this topic of traditions and, and specifically the, the history of the church, the universal church and church tradition, uh, that, that comes down to the issue of institutions. And this is a topic that's brought up uh, from conservatives a, a lot, is the value of institutions, social institutions in particular, like family and church and community and business and all these sorts of things. And, you know, actually, uh, LCI recently released our mission, vision, and core values, uh, which we, we put a lot of work into that over a period of months. We got a lot of feedback. and It sort of serves as a, a, a both an indicator of kind of the purpose of the organization and what we 
sort of all unite around and also kind of a roadmap of where we're going. And institutions figure prominently into the LCI core values. So Norm, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure, Nick. The, the Fundamentally, what we care about is the, is the community that we live in. Uh, we understand as Christians that we are not meant to be alone. Uh, and that's the way that God created us. That is explicated in the book of Genesis, uh, you know, in chapters one through three. And that's why, you know, that's why men and women were created to be together. And that's the foundation of the family, which is probably the most foundational institution that we, that we, that exists. And from there, we're able to create even, you know, more and more complex institutions that, that spawn off of that even, uh, whether we're talking about businesses or clubs or just, you know, little communities where we're, where we're living, you know, close, closer together, or we're talking about the grander institution of, of you know, Christ, uh, 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 Christ Church and the way that that plays out into society. We recognize, especially, like, hopefully we should recognize as Christian libertarians that this is something that fundamentally we're, we're built to do. We're, we're intended to live in community as individuals. And, and it's really only through a proper understanding of the individual that we come to a proper understanding of what those communities look like. So absolutely, we believe in the importance of institutions um, and, and like conservatives you know, claim to do as well. But the difference really comes as to how we view the individual as part of that. There is a definite strain in conservative thought that kind of views the institutions as being in a way superior to the individual. In a sense, it, it, and this comes into the way that they, they view things often like conscription for that matter. That, well, this, it is important to sacrifice oneself for the benefit of the state. You'll hear, I mean, you, you, you hear this in the rhetoric. You know it to be true. I mean, if you've been in, involved in conservative politics at all, you know that to be true. But there's a difference in the way that the libertarian looks at it. Uh, we don't see individuals as something to be suppressed for some sort of benefit of all, but that every individual has a dignity that is independent of the community, but that works within it. That flip-flopping of perspective there uh, doesn't diminish that institutions are important. It just emphasizes the way in which we view individuals and, and, and their responsibilities within it. So I think that's that's kind of the way that we nuanced explain it differently, even though we kind of have uh, a similar type of view with conservatives. Um, but it's just that 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 little bit of nuance makes a difference. And that if you don't have a real proper understanding of individualism, you're going to miss something about the nature of community. And you'll end up with kind of contradictory ways of thinking uh, at that point. That it's okay for uh, the end of su uh, of supporting the community in some way. That's uh, it's justifiable then to use a means that completely destroys an individual, uh, which is something that you kind of can get to in certain uh, in certain ways of thinking from a conservative perspective. Right. You know, oftentimes you'll hear people from both the political left and right talk about the collective as if it's this holy <laughs> well holy yes i mean you, you certainly you certainly get that like reading rousseau and lead up to the french revolution this idea oh, yeah. of you need the civil religion and everything has to be subsumed under the state but but also they they speak of the state as if it is sentient like it's it's yes. like society is this thing that that thinks and acts and yeah that's just society that's wants true. this or deserves this or needs to do this and society can't let this happen or something like that. Yeah. Right. And, or, and, and you hear that in, in any, any kind of, you hear that with, with different descriptions of groups as well, like the, the such and such community or whatever. But this idea, it, it all basically boils down to the collective being able to think and act, which is just not the case. That's, that's not true. It's, it's philosophical nonsense. It makes no logical sense at all. The collective is merely a collection of individuals and individuals are sentient and individuals act. This is, this is a core insight of Austrian economics. I mean, this is really sort of the basis upon which all Austrian economic thought is built is 
what Mises called human ac- action, praxeology, the acting man, the individual making choices. Uh, and the, the, the collective, I mean, it, it is a thing, but it's not a sentient thing. Uh, and, and probably the, the one place where we really see sort of there, there is a metaphysical element uh, is, is in the church because we're bound together by the Holy Spirit, and there's something to that. But even in the in, in the epistles, the apostolic epistles, you you see this same idea. You know, Paul critiques those who think that because uh, they they don't hold a certain role in the collective, that they don't matter as an individual. The the, the individuals are the constituent parts of the whole, and you can't separate that as if they can they can be pitted against one another. The individuals make up the whole, and individuals within the collective are thinking and acting. Uh, so to treat the collective, society or otherwise, as if it's just some big amorphous thing, uh, is is a total fallacy, and it's it's a fallacy that is prolifically. Uh, made by progressives and conservatives. And let's emphasize that in one additional way too, Nick. You know, contrary to the anti-individualist perspective, Paul is absolutely explicit in his desire to see every individual who who is in the, the church as utilizing their gifts through the Holy Spirit for the benefit of the church. So, and for the and for the praise and glory of God, for that matter, that is something that is you know if you can't see that in Paul's epistles, then you're you're really missing out. Uh, you're 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 probably just you know you you need to go reread some paragraphs there, <laughs> because that's absolutely clear. You know that that nobody is is left behind in this sense in the in the in the church. Uh, Paul Paul doesn't let that let anybody you know kind of get a free pass there. Paul says that every Christian has been given a gift by God uh, that that he's meant to use for the praise and glory of God uh, within the church to accomplish good work, and you know that that's something to re- to remember. And while it may be you know it may be true, and and it's a good it's a good way of explaining it that the church can ha- act with some kind of metaphysical uh, aspect to it. You know that doesn't confer then that all other institutions uh, act in the same way. So. In, in a sense, by trying to marry those qualities of the church onto other, uh, you know, human institutions, it's actually like really problematic from a spiritual point of view. <laughs> like it, it, we kind of should remember that, I guess, as well, is that conferring the aspects of the church onto uh, a human institution, whether that's a business or or, the, or even worse, the state, that's a huge flaw. That's a really, really bad thing to do. So don't think that that's the way that the state needs to operate. It is absolutely not the church. In fact, that, that actually alludes to, you know, the, the, old, uh, the old phrase that I used to, you know, kind of have on LCC all the time, which was the state is not the kingdom of God, period. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and that was our motto, in a sense, for, for quite a long time. And, uh, and we still adhere to that in, in, in every respect. And, you know, along those lines, uh, you'll often hear specifically for American conservatism, right? We're, we're zeroing in here on, on the United States, so this isn't a, a blanket application to conservatism everywhere in the world. But American conservatism uh, will generally profess a, a high regard for the U.S. Constitution. And in some cases, even more than a high regard, there, there are even many conservatives uh, who, are, who are also of some religious persuasion – who would say that the U.S. Constitution was divinely inspired, which is just a, a baffling thing to me, but I've heard that more times than I'd ever like to have heard. Uh, we actually did an episode with Tom Woods recently about constitutional history, which touched on a lot of really good points. I, I, I enjoyed that episode immensely, and I think a lot of our listeners did as well. Uh, and and Tom was gracious enough to rebroadcast it on his own show. But the, the point is that for many conservatives, it's it's almost like the Constitution is this uh, sacred document that is just sort of floating out here beyond criticism and comes down from the heavens 
And I, I, I mean, there's different ways we can look at this as libertarians. And we, we covered some of it in our episode with Tom Woods. I think that, you know, there, there, there's much in the Constitution that I would, I would be glad vis-a-vis the status quo if we were following or the government was following. We'd certainly have a, a much, much smaller government, probably 90 percent smaller, if it was actually adhering to the original intent of the U.S. Constitution. But along those same lines, uh, and we have to look at – I mean I, I, nobody's ever said this better I think than Lysander Spooner in No Treason, The Constitution of No Authority. Uh, and, and when I first read that line – and I'm not going to quote it here, but I mean many of you are, are familiar with it. When I first read it back when I was a minarchist, it kind of like it, – it blew me away. Uh, but it, I still think it's one of the best ways of describing the issue. Basically, Spooner – and he's writing in like the 1850s, 1860s – says that considering the size and scope of government in our day – and keep in mind he's writing like I just said 150 years ago. Considering the size and scope of government in our day, he says, the Constitution has either permitted this to happen or has been powerless to stop it. In either case, it's unfit to exist. That was his argument. So when we're looking at the Constitution and dialoguing with conservatives about it, that has to be pointed out. You know, I mean, uh, all, all the time you hear from conservatives, we got to adhere to the Constitution. The Constitution is this perfect system. And I mean, we can, we can admire in many ways, you know, improvements maybe that the Constitution made over older political systems that were a bit more arbitrary and tyrannical. Uh, but in some ways, it was worse. Like, I, I certainly think it's inferior to the Articles of Confederation. The Articles never would have allowed uh, the government to get as big as it has simply because the, 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 the structures, like the taxing structures, weren't even in place to fund it. Uh, and it certainly doesn't compare to the straight up Declaration of Independence either, at least the princi- in principles. Right. And so, I mean, we can talk about how slavery was handled there. And, you know, you may have some people come back and say, well, it was necessary to get it passed. And I mean, I like that's sort of so what. But, you know, (laughs) maybe we would have been better off if it wasn't passed. Like if we were still with the articles, I think we'd be a lot better off. Yeah. I visited the National Archives in D.C. I'm looking at the articles uh, like the original copy. I'm like, boy, I wish this was still in effect. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. Here's the much better constitution, the original constitution. Um, and I realize this strikes as, as radical to some people. Um, oh, but, okay. But I think it's, it's uh, kind but, of important <laughs> to remember, too, that, like, you know, as you said, there are plenty of things there that would be in the in the constitution that would be better than the status quo. And and that leads, I think, us to, to kind of view it with a proper skepticism, if you will, that includes Lysander Spooner's uh, insights that, you know, that well certainly didn't stop it completely, but it also is is a kind of explication on the nature of the state in many ways. And that is that the libertarian idea is that, you know, we recognize that like the state is always looking to expand itself and to, and consolidate power unto itself. And it's going to do that whether or not, you know, there's a, a constitution in place. The constitution really shows us and we can we, we can use it like a bludgeon, if you will to tell people like the, the state doesn't even follow the rules that it sets up for itself. In fact, it's always looking to subvert it. And in any way that you try to keep, you know, to keep it in check, the state is going to be trying to weasel its way out. And that's like, that's important too. And to, to kind of give it its due, but realize its limitations. And that's something that conservatives, I think, kind of don't really think about is that the way that they think of its limitations is, oh, well, there's certain things that didn't do well. And so we need to fix it in order to make, uh, you know, our objectives better. But the, the libertarian looks at that as, as well, the things that it didn't do well are the, the ways in which it didn't keep restricting itself. And that, that if anything, you know, it, it, pro- realistic progress for the libertarian in the sense, in, in a sense of like, where where we'd like to see uh, go, and you know, and that would be in principle correct is it would be a system in which it got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as time went on, and instead we got the exact opposite. So why why is that the case? And that's why we have a healthy skepticism about the U.S. Constitution, recognizing it for kind of for what it is: is that it yes, it's an innovation. There were good things about it. 
but it is not some sacred document that fell out of the sky and was presented to us on two stone tablets. You know, it, it was written by men who were fallen and and who had incorrect who had improper principles at times. They were not terrible people, but they were they were still sinful people, just as we are now, in fact. So, you know, what we what we have to adhere to is uh, is an ethical position that is incontrovertible. And we have to keep pressing for that sort of positioning uh, overall. And if you want kind of a sarcastic soundbite argument to make in 10 seconds to conservatives <laughs> on the Constitution, you can say, well, you know, actually, if you're going to look at tradition, the articles were older and the Constitution is really the liberal innovation here. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, no, that, that's sort of true, though. I think that's, that's a fair point. Yeah. Well, let's talk as we kind of close out here. I think it's a good idea to kind of talk about what are some good ways to reach out to conservatives for the cause of liberty. Nick, what do you what do you kind of think about this? What are some of the things that in particular got you thinking in these different sorts of ways? And uh, and I'll actually let me start off with that. And I'll tell you kind of, you know, I've told this story before. And so I'll kind of shorten it a little bit. Um, and, and maybe this will help people out a little uh, in, in kind of helping other folks to understand I will admit that I tend to approach a lot of things from a, from an intensely logical and analytic perspective. And that comes from kind of my own education as an engineer and a, and a scientist. And that that's just the way I think. Um, but what got me really thinking about things differently was just this flat out study of economics and the discussion of economic principles uh, with with people that I knew that thought differently than I did kind of helped me to begin seeing things differently. And I started, I mean, I really changed my positions by reading our, like economics from the, from the Austrian perspective. And that helps a lot of people in cases. So sometimes it's just a matter of, of sharing good material with them and saying, hey, why don't, you know, you, you, uh, you seem to have, you know, an affinity for free markets, uh, oh, oh, Norman. Why don't you take a look at this article and see what you think? And then maybe that leads to another thing. And then maybe that leads to discussion. And that maybe sometimes that works. Uh, just from a purely, you know, just educational point of view, like that's a way to do it. I, I was always a Christian. It took really learning about things differently uh, from an economics perspective to really get the ball rolling. What do you think, Nick? Is there what kind of stuff uh, got you kind of moving in this direction? Well, for me, it was it, it started off more with learning to distrust the the abilities and and the nobility of government and. So, I mean, it, whenever government is delegitimized by being proven to be incompetent or corrupt or whatever, that's a positive sort of step. And it was a lot of stuff like that that kind of first got me uh, saying, well, well, wait a second. Uh, here I am. I'm a, I, I'm a, I was a neoconservative. I didn't call myself a neoconservative, but I called myself a conservative. But like, oh, here I am. I'm a conservative. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the state can help solve all these problems and, and preserve order and tradition in society. But wait a second, like, here's all these empirical examples of the state just totally failing to even do any of that on its own, on, on, on the very terms of the thing it's supposed to be doing or that I think it's supposed to be doing. It's still failing. Uh, and, and so that that's the sort of things that sort of got me first really moving in that direction. And then as I moved further along, uh, yeah, the study of economics, uh, learning from uh, works like at, at the Mises Institute and listening to Ron Paul speak and just all these different libertarian thinkers and then things start coming together. So, I, I mean, but it really depends on the individual, you know, and, and we covered this recently in our question and response episodes, like how do you reach out to somebody? And my answer was it really kind of depends on the individual. People are going to have different journeys uh, along that path. But fundamentally, and I said this in in the Q&R episode, somebody has to be willing to listen in order to change their mind. Like if you've got somebody that's just totally obstinate and they don't want to hear what you have to say and they're an ignorant person, but they think they know everything, which is a dangerous position to be in. Uh, <laughs> you just you're you're, you're not going to win. It doesn't matter how how good yeah. an argument you have; they're not going to listen because they've closed off their mind and then they they don't have ears to hear. Um, well, and and you alluded to this too, and I, I just want to emphasize this: like your ability to to listen to the other side will definitely come in handy as well. Your willingness to go through a conversation will often say a lot 
about, you know, the philosophy that you hold, you know, because one thing I, I have, an, I have another point I want to go at eventually before we conclude. But like, I have a friend, he's a good, he's a professor. His name is Jim Lark. He's a great libertarian man um, who often would say like, essentially that a lot of times when you're having discussions about liberty with people, um, they are kind of inwardly asking the question, is the type of society that you envision one that I would want to live in? And they're going to answer that question with you as the example. Uh, and so the way that you live your life and the way that you respond to them is exemplar at that point. At that moment, you are the libertarian par excellence in front of them. And so it's important to be the kind of person, well, that frankly, that you'd want to, uh, that you'd want to interact with on a regular basis. And if we are constantly badgering and, and, and verbally, as one of our, one of our admins in the Facebook groups like to say, kind of a conversational terrorist at times, you know, we don't need to behave like that in order to just win every argument and, and try and make our point. So it's kind of a, it's kind of crucial to exemplify that, dare I say, kind of just the good Christian point of view uh, in order to win other people over into the to our way of thinking, to be that kind of listener, if you will. And that I think that's really crucial. The final thing, and I'd be remiss to point out, is that there are times in which we can make, we, and we ought to make, the theological argument against the state. And while this may be a little more nuanced for some people, uh, it's important, especially as Christian libertarians. I mean, we can't expect non-Christian libertarians to ever get there in this respect. But it's important for us as Christians and libertarians to become well-versed in what the Bible says about violence, about the state, and the arguments that flow from that into liberty. Uh, we, we understand inherently that this is the case. That is, our, that is our business as LCI to put out there. And we're constantly trying to do that and help, and help everybody in that journey. Um, but let me just conclude with that. Like, Become theologically literate. You will do yourself a huge favor by doing so. Not only will you be able to be a better advocate for liberty as a result, but you'll be constantly improving your walk with Christ. I mean, how could we, you know, not end this episode by saying something about that? So if we can, you know, encourage you in anything, it is to stay faithful to the calling that you've received as a Christian, you know, and keep learning. We'll try and help you in that. And, and thus, you know, we'll hopefully join you on that journey to hopefully bring in a lot of conservatives over, Christian conservatives over to the libertarian way of thinking. And so I think that's a good place to stop. Nick, is there anything else you want to say? Or just, I think we can probably just conclude there. Yep, let's conclude. All right, guys, we are always appreciative of you listening in. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. The audio engineers were Doug Stewart and Jason Rink, and voiceovers were by Matthew Bellis and Caitlin Horn. If you'd like to find out more about the LCI, please visit us on the web at www.libertarianchristians.com. Music